Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar on optimising glyphosate applications for summer weed control. My name is Jason Ems. I'm the weeds manager at GRDC. Um, I've also got my colleague Randall Wilkes um, with me, who you'll see later on today. Um, recently, uh, some parts of the country have suffered absolute deluge um, and that's created a lot of challenges. One of those is, of course, um, weed control. Uh, summer weeds are a uh, challenge to control at the best of times with high temperatures and, and dust and staggered germination and also a vast spectrum of different weed species that you've all got to control um, at the same time. Um, luckily, to try and uh, discuss and help us through some of these challenges, uh, we've got Mark Congreve from ICANN to help us talk us um, through that, Mark has an absolute wealth of experience and knowledge on optimising um, herbicide behaviour and spends a lot of effort and a lot of his time sharing that knowledge. So we're very lucky uh, to have Mark here today. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Jason. Um, and welcome, everybody. So, uh, yeah, thanks there for the introduction. <clears throat> uh, Randall kicked off this project a week or so ago uh, in response to all the summer rain, particularly uh, across parts of South Australia, and thought it would be a good idea to jump on and do a webinar on glyphosate, particularly with some of the challenges we have with glyphosate at the moment around pricing and availability. So we'll pull this web webinar together relatively quickly. Um, I'm going to lead it today. We've got over 200 people registered for this webinar. Um, so we're gonna have a lot of people there. I suspect we'll end up with a fair few questions. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. The way I plan to run today is probably run for about 50 minutes or so on optimizing glyphosate. I'm not gonna have time today to go through optimizing all the other herbicides that you know, we might be wanting to use over the summer fallow. I'm gonna mainly focus on glyphosate because it's doing the bulk of the job for us. Um, I'm going to try to pull it up in around about 50 minutes and then follow by a Q&A session for about sort of 40 minutes or so, 30 or 40 minutes, uh, planned to be done in around about an hour and a half for this webinar. Encourage your questions. Um, we'll try to answer as many of those as possible. Can you please submit those via the Q&A function on Zoom um, or via the chat function? Um, both Randall and Erica, um, from ICANN are gonna be monitoring those in the background. And we will try, attempt to get through as many of your questions as possible. We've got a couple of pre-loaded questions that have come in, um, which we can also touch on as well. We might not get through all the questions, um, but we'll do our best to address you know, most of the questions that are there. I have put a bullet point there to say, I don't see this webinar getting into specifics of a particular weed by herbicide by application rate. Um, I really am loath to go down that path if you want to understand you know, what product you would be using for a particular situation. Um, I can't see those weeds. I don't know what's happening in the paddock. I don't know what the moisture content is. I don't know what your common names are. Um, so please can we stay away from, you know, I want a particular rate of product for a particular weed system uh, situation. Uh, but as far as how products work, happy to handle all that sort of uh, question and answer uh, today. And as I said, we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we possibly can. The webinar is being recorded. Uh, you, as registrants to the webinar, you'll get sent a link to the recording when we've got it up and loaded. Um, we'll load that up on the GRDC website after the event. There will be a short exit survey uh, coming if you, uh, at the end of this webinar. If you would spend a minute uh, filling that in, it would be appreciated. And you might want to write down that uh, webinar ID number if you're on phone and you happen to drop out and you need that number to get back in. Uh, that's the webinar number for today's webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to jump in, <clears throat> excuse me, jump into talking about glyphosate and what I think is important to optimise glyphosate. So first slide I've got here, um, <clears throat> two real factors that influence how well glyphosate is going to work for us. First one is how much we can get into the leaf. And I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about that today. It's one of the biggest challenges we have with glyphosate is actually getting it into the leaf in the first place. 
And if there's one take home, there's probably two main take home messages I wanna leave you with today. The first one is that when you go and apply a litre per hectare of glyphosate or two litres or whatever your chosen rate may be, don't assume that all of that has got into the leaf. You've got a percentage of that herbicide will move into the leaf. The rest of it's gonna dry on the leaf, go crystal and probably not move into the leaf. Our objective is to get as much as possible, if we're trying to optimise the product, get as much as possible into the leaf. So I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time talking about what makes that tick. The second bit is where glyphosate differentiates itself from the rest is its activity down in the roots of the plant. And if we can get translocation down to the roots of the plant, that's gonna be really useful for getting maximum efficacy on glyphosate. So there's a couple of points I wanna make with regard to translocation of the roots, but mostly I'm gonna spend time on getting it into the plant because that's really where uh, how we're applying the product can make a big difference. So let's jump into that. So what's gonna help and what's gonna hinder the performance of glyphosate? So I've tried to summarize this and I'll come back at the end of the day and wrap it up again, but pretty simply helping glyphosate, it's all around time on that leaf surface. The longer we can have the glyphosate sitting on that leaf surface in a state ready to move into the plant, the better. I'll talk a fair bit about ammonium sulfate and why that helps glyphosate a lot. Small fresh weeds, you've heard that before. I'm gonna talk about why that's important. And uh, if we're prepared to do double knocks, that's gonna certainly help out glyphosate give uh, reliable control. The correct adjuvant, the correct spray setup, I'll talk a little bit about those. And I've put a comment in there, patience. Glyphosate is slow product, uh, slow to enter the leaf and it's slow to work. We need to give it time to do its job. On the flip side, what, stops glyphosate from being optimised, um, obviously resistance. Um, and usually with glyphosate resistance, quite often it's a relatively weak re resistance and it will respond to application rate, but certainly it's gonna make it harder because we've got to get more into the plant. Large weeds, hot temperatures. I'll spend a fair bit of time talking about temperature and the effect on glyphosate. I'll spend a bit of time talking about water quality. Um, Spend a little bit of time talking about adjuvants because that is a big topic for glyphosate. We really want the right adjuvant at the right rate. And if we do things otherwise, we might not be optimizing glyphosate. Basically anything that speeds up brownout is gonna be working against the way glyphosate's gonna work. Most things we throw in the spray tank um, actually detract from glyphosate. Now that doesn't mean that the combination isn't a good and smart thing to do. But we need to understand that if we're going to throw a partner herbicide into the spray tank, we're probably going to be slightly or significantly compromising the glyphosate. We need to overcome that. So we need to uh, understand we're making some compromises there. And mixing issues, um, obviously, we don't want things to go wrong in the spray tank. So we'll touch on that a little bit as well. So to start the whole thing and talk about why it's important to get glyphosate in the leaf, I wanna go back to very much year nine biology. So most of us would understand that plants have two transport systems. They have the phloem and the xylem. The phloem transporting sugars around the plant and the xylem transporting water from the soil up through the roots. So they're both important for glyphosate. It is a fully translocated herbicide. <clears throat> If it needs to move down to the roots, that means it has to move in the phloem. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I wanna mostly start by talking about the transportation or the process of uh, water transportation within plants. So we've got soluble minerals dissolved in the water. The plant wants those nutrients to feed itself for growth. How does it do it? It extracts those nutrients out of the water, out of the soil, as they're dissolved in the soil moisture. The way the plant actually gets those in is via the process of transpiration. So transpiration, what does it mean by that? A droplet of water eventually makes its way out of the leaf onto the leaf surface and then is lost to evaporation into the atmosphere. So if we have a whole heap of plants in a room, shut up all the windows, we're gonna get a whole heap of condensation on the windows. That's transpiration, being water being lost out of the roots of the plant. The reason the plant does that is it loses a moisture, uses, loses a molecule of moisture off the leaf surface, which then is attached to another molecule further deeper into the plant and moving all the way down. So if it loses a 
water molecule off the leaf surface, it pulls another one in through the roots. And by doing that, it's pulling the minerals and the uh, nutrients in from the root system. So plants need to be transpiring to feed themselves. But they also need to regulate how fast they lose that moisture out of the leaf. Because if they if you're under really high temperatures and high evaporation conditions, like we might be doing a lot in summer spraying, those water molecules can be lost very fast on the leaf and the plant might not be able to suck in moisture fast enough to be able to replace them. So the plant needs to manage that process. So if you think about summer weeds, what are they tend to look like? So weeds that are adapted for growth over summer tend to have a couple of key features. They might have hairs on the leaf. And what's that designed to do? It's designed to keep a microclimate very close to that uh, leaf surface. So that's gonna change the rate of that uh, moisture that's evaporating or transpiring out of that leaf surface. They also tend to have really waxy uh, surfaces as well. So you think they're putting a, a photo of a prickly pear, that's the ultimate summer weed. Um, really super waxy, plenty of moisture inside the plant, but really waxy on the outside of the plant. Why do they have those waxes? Because that's gonna slow down that uh, transpiration loss. Um, so if you're gonna be adapted for summer growth, you're gonna have higher and thicker and denser waxes in your cuticle to slow down that moisture loss out of the um, inner parts of the plant uh, via transpiration. Now, why is all that important? If you're talking about a, a water loving herbicide, or I'll talk about a lipophilic, uh, sorry, a hydrophilic herbicide, if it's water loving, it's got to penetrate through that waxy cuticle. It's got to go in the opposite direction. We put out our spray, the droplets landed on the leaf. It's got to move against that waxy cuticle into the plant. So what tends to happen out in the field is all the easy to control weeds in summer don't have those waxy cuticles. It's easier to get the glyphosate into the plant. Um, we had struggle the most with those plants which have real thick waxy cuticles because glyphosate being a water loving herbicide uh, struggles to penetrate back through that uh, thicker waxy cuticle. And they tend to be the weeds that give us the most problems in summer because we can't get the same amount of glyphosate into the plant because of that leaf surface. So I've already introduced hydrophilic and lipophilic terminology. So what do I quickly mean by those? So some herbicides are water loving, hydrophilic, some are more fat loving, lipophilic. Um, how do we, you know, the, it's the water loving herbicides which are gonna be the ones that are gonna difficult, more difficult to penetrate that waxy cuticle. So how do we identify those? So first thing is they're probably gonna be formulated as an amine or a salt. So if they're gonna be a water loving herbicide, they're gonna go into solution, well, why don't we just use water as a carrier for our formulation? So we make them as an amine or a salt and they're pretty simple formulations. They go into solution easily. So that's your first giveaway. If it's amine or salt, it's pretty much gonna be a water loving herbicide. Um, they'll tend to be soluble liquid formulations, um, tend to be products that when you put them into the spray tank, they just go straight into solution. Doesn't even look like you've put that herbicide into the spray tank. Um, they don't go milky. So they tend to be water loving herbicides. If you look on their label for the rain fast period, they'll tend to have rain fast periods of in excess of an hour, you know, maybe four hours, six hours, eight hours, things like that. So what's that telling me straight up? Telling me that herbicide's gonna take a long time sitting on the leaf surface to actually move into the cuticle of the plant. They're a water loving herbicide. Oils generally aren't gonna help their performance. So they don't want to partner up with an oil. So if you wanna throw in an oil adjuvant, it's probably not gonna do much for those herbicides. So the key thing with these herbicides is they're slow to enter the leaf, but once they get through that waxy cuticle, they'll speed up because most of the environment that they're coming across inside the plant is a water-based environment. Conversely, if you're a fat loving herbicide, most of the opposites are gonna apply. So you're probably gonna be, you know, anything that's in an ester is gonna be in a fat loving form. Anything that's in an EC formulation, that's a bit of a giveaway that it's gonna be a fat loving herbicide because it's not gonna dissolve in water. So we're gonna use some sort of oil-based sol uh, solvent to uh, get that herbicide into formulation. They're gonna be the products that are gonna to tend to have a rain fast period of, you know, less than an hour. Um, as a general rule of thumb. So they're gonna move into that waxy cuticle pretty quickly because they're a fat loving herbicide. They like that waxy environment. 
And these are the herbicides that are going to really respond well to oil-based adjuvants. So their challenge is they're relatively fast into the leaf, but then they slow down as they hit the water-based environment more deeper inside the leaf. So the best place to be somewhere in between the two, the further you go in either extreme, the more difficult it is for one pathway or the other. Um, but we're talking about glyphosate today. I'm looking at the water-loving side of the page. They're the properties that we're going to be dealing with for glyphosate. Did add a bullet point there, paraquat and diquat, they're exceptions. They are water-loving herbicides, but they're also fast to enter the leaf. That's all around the, the um, positive charge and the negative charge of the leaf surface. So that sort of goes against all the other rules. But for all the other herbicides, uh, water-loving, slower to enter the leaf, fat-loving, much faster to enter the leaf. <clears throat> so why did I say is all that's important? So I've just got a simple diagram here of the cross section of the leaf. We've got the waxy cuticle right along the leaf surface. There's strands of waxes down to the first layer of cells, if you can follow my pointer down here. And in between these strands of waxes, there's a thing called the cutin, which is a water-based spongy material. The plant can modify the component of this cuticle or the water concentration of this cuticle by how much water it pumps into that uh, water-based cutin material. So if conditions are good, it will fully hydrate that cuticle. If conditions are hot and dry and there's fast evaporation, it withdraws moisture out of this cuticle, makes it more wax dense, and that's gonna slow the rate of a water molecule which is moving up and trying to move through that cuticle, get onto the leaf surface to be transpired and be lost. So the plants adjusting the moisture content of that cuticle all the time based on the environmental conditions that it's um, experienced at the point in time. But if it's a weed that's going to be growing over summer, the percentage of these waxes is going to be much higher as well, but it's still going to be adjusting that moisture content of the actual cuticle. So if I'm going to put out my glyphosate under hot, low humidity conditions, two things are going to happen. This Cuticle is going to be less, is going to contain less moisture, which is going to be slower for my droplet to penetrate. And the droplet is going to evaporate faster. So it's going to have less time sitting on that leaf surface to penetrate. So two things going against glyphosate for summer applications. So a data set just to back that up, I'll skip through this pretty quickly. Um, this happens to be barnyard grass data um, done in the lab, but it shows a very strong message of what I'm trying to say. So sprayed some susceptible barnyard grass under growing under warm conditions, so 20, 25 degrees, warm but not hot. And the rate we needed to get 100% control, so effectively about 250 mil per hectare of product. Very low rate. You're not going to be using that rate um, in the field, but that's what in the lab conditions was enough to control that population. Same population growing under hot conditions. Take the temperature up to 30, 35 degrees and we needed about three times the rate of product and we still only got to 90% control that was highest rate was tested in this situation. That's just the fact of the droplet drying faster and the cuticle being thicker responding to that hotter drying conditions. So what we typically do when we're trying to look at summer applications is we increase application rate to cover these type of bases. So if we're out there you know, dealing, we're not gonna use 250 mils, we're gonna probably apply 750 or a litre under most summer applications of glyphosate to address this factor that we can't get as much into the plant. In this trial, really interesting, they had a weak resistant glyphosate population where they also tested it for the same thing. So in the weak resistant population under those mild temperatures, Again, we got control if we were up at that sort of 750 mil rate. You then overlay the hot conditions and they went up to two litres per hectare and they still only got 90% control. So resistance plus temperature makes things so much harder again because it's a matter of getting enough product into the plant. And so this is what we're seeing a lot, particularly in the north now, we've got a lot of glyphosate resistance is we're seeing you know, uh, the combination of glyphosate resistance and hot temperature needing very big application rates or leading to unsuccessful control. Time on leaf. I mentioned that's important to get glyphosate into the uh, plant. So this 
data set here is taken from the New Farm Crucial Tech Guide. Um, really good data set because it's using radio labeled um, glyphosate, obviously done under lab conditions or under glasshouse conditions, but it shows the speed of glyphosate getting into the leaf for two different formulations, Crucial versus Argo. And you can see that after you know an hour to two hours, we've still only got a fraction of the glyphosate moving into the leaf. In this situation, by six hours plus, we've got the majority of the glyphosate in the leaf. And this is obviously done under lab conditions. Out in the field, have we got six hours of droplet survival out there in the paddock to get all of the glyphosate into the plant? And my argument would be for summer applications, usually the answer is no. So you're only gonna be getting a fraction of what you're applied into the plant. Much better to be getting 60, 70, 80% of the herbicide in uh, before that droplet dries out than 10, 20, 30%. What do we need to do to get as much as we possibly can into the leaf um, as fast as we can? We can help things with how we're gonna set up our sprayer and what adjuvants we're gonna use, but we still need to understand that it's gonna be slow to get into the leaf, even with the best quality formulations and the best spray setup, and we're still gonna get a percentage into the plant. So I've probably covered off on some of these points already, how much we get in it's gonna be different with different species. So those waxy, hairy leaf surfaces, we're not gonna get as much glyphosate in the plant. That's why they're gonna be the ones that are gonna give us the most trouble from a summer um, application perspective. So temperature and humidity after application. So this is where your Delta T comes in. If we've got you know, conditions whereby we've got low temperature and high humidity after application, that droplet's gonna be the drop of survival is going to be longer. We're going to have more time to get some more herbicide in. If we've got high temperatures and low humidity, that drop is going to evaporate super fast and we might only be getting you know, an hour or maybe a little bit longer um, worth of time to penetrate. And you saw on that last graph what that means for, life, for leaf uptake. Droplet size is generally important. So if we go to very large droplets, they're gonna survive a lot longer on the leaf surface, can give us more time to get more product in than what a small droplet will under hot, low humidity conditions. Um, that might be different in autumn or winter application where you've got much less rate of droplet evaporation and we, the, the difference between droplet size may not be as common, uh, may be as obvious, but under summer, certainly as a general rule of thumb, large droplets survive large longer. The flip side to that is large droplets are more likely to bounce off the surface. So if you've got an easy surface to capture the droplets, it probably doesn't matter. If you've got a difficult catching surface, like a small one leaf grass weed that's upright, it's more likely that, that those large droplets are gonna bounce off. So it's not always that large droplets are the way to go, but as a general rule of thumb, large, larger rather than smaller droplets for glyphosate in summer. I'll talk about water quality in a second. Um, concentration, so with, with all products, they generally move better from a high concentration to a low concentration. So having a high concentration on the outside of the leaf and no herbicide inside the leaf generally speeds up movement. So lower water rates rather than higher water rates for glyphosate, all other things being equal, is probably where we're gonna see the fastest speed of uptake. Um, I'll talk a little bit about incompatibility in a minute. And I'll talk a little bit more about the correct adjuvant and how that's going to affect what's happening on the leaf surface. So these ones here, much more important on summer um, than they are, say, in an autumn to winter application. All of these, what we're doing, the main strategy we're using to overcome those in the field is application rate. We're selecting a big rate to overcome where these things aren't working for us. That's not so important when glyphosate's $4 a litre. If it's $14 a litre, that becomes uh, challenging just to use application rate to overcome some of these issues. Data set from Pete Boxalis presented last year's updates. Uh, just showing here where we went from hot, dry conditions, went through a big change into much milder conditions. So you can see there delta Ts and temperatures. When you're up around high temperatures, high delta Ts, we're not getting much glyphosate activity um, when it's applied at the same rate, noting it's a very low rate of glyphosate on ryegrass. Once that temperature changes, um, we've got lower temperatures, much lower rates of evaporation control has 
kicked in very strongly, even with a very low rate of glyphosate. It's all around how much herbicide gets in through the leaf. A lot of other things happen with regard to spray quality. So busy slide, lots of bits and pieces, haven't got time to go through it all. But obviously, if we're gonna use large droppers, we're gonna have less of them. They're gonna be much less prone to drift and they're going to survive longer. So they're all good things to be out in your very coarse or larger. They're gonna be more challenging to be able to adhere to the leaf surface. They're gonna be much more likely to bounce. So if you've got a difficult catching surface, they may not be the way to go. It's gonna depend on your species. If we're back down this side, um, obviously the challenge is actually having droplet survival and getting it to the leaf in the first place. But if you get it there, they're probably gonna capture on the leaf surface better. So with glyphosate, we're probably gonna be wanting to operate somewhere around coarse to very coarse. Um, if we've got 2,4-D in the mix, legally we have to be at very coarse or larger. I'm probably gonna want a spray set up on my sprayer to go out to extra coarse or ultra coarse for very drift sensitive situations, or if I need to be spraying under high evaporation conditions, that's when I'm gonna to go to those larger droplets, realizing it's a compromise, but it's probably a good compromise to make. I'm gonna be down at the medium to medium coarse end of the spectrum. If I'm chasing hard to wet leaf, upright catching targets, um, but I'm only going to do that under mild conditions and I obviously can't have 2,4-D in the mix if I'm going down that uh, set, set up. So there's no one right position. It's often a compromise, but usually when we're sitting somewhere around very coarse uh, for most of our summer applications of glide. What else impacts glyphosate? Water quality is really important. So I'll skip through this pretty quickly. Um, dirty water, we need clean water for glyphosate. Glyphosate binds really well to soil. That's why we don't have any soil residual out of glyphosate in most situations. Same thing's happening if you've got dirt in your spray tank. You need to have clean water for glyphosate, otherwise you're compromising a lot of performance before it even gets out of the spray tank. pH, mostly dealing with underground water in this situation. Um, glyphosate's an acid. Glyphosate will naturally drop the pH of your spray tank. Do you need to drop the spray, pH your spray tank beforehand? Personally, I don't think in most situations you really need to worry too much about it. Um, it's more around hard water. I hear a lot of times, you know, oh, we can affect, we can address hard water by dropping the pH. Through in this data set, photos courtesy of New Farm, um, they sent me a couple of years ago now, which I still keep using those. So here we've got glyphosate, plus Collide 700 and acidifying uh, adjuvant. So we've acidified the spray tank. When it's applied in soft water, it's done a reasonably good job. Applied in hard water, it still hasn't delivered the performance we're expecting out of. So we have dropped the pH, but we haven't addressed hardness and that's not adequate for glyphosate. So it's not the pH that's the issue, it's the hardness that's the issue. So what do I mean um, by water quality and poor water quality with regard to alkalinity and um, hardness? So two factors you need to be conscious of with your spray water. First one's the bicarbonate concentration or reported as total alkalinity. Not every spray tank, every um, water test will actually report total alkalinity or total bicarbonates. Sometimes you might have to request that as an extra. But look for, that's a really important one to understand the quality of your water. So look for your total alkalinity. You're really wanting water to be less than about 75 parts per million. If it's above that, it's gonna start knocking around your clethodim or your dims in general and your amines. Um, if you're dealing with bore water coming out of uh, the ground, there's a fair chance it may be up around your intermediate or even up into your poor quality. Um, and often, often people aren't looking at that at all. So that's one key thing to look at. The other one's the total hardness, which most people are looking at. Um, it's particularly about, uh, calcium that's driving performance on glyphosate, but total hardness will measure all the cations in the water. Again, if you've got hardness over 400 ppm, it's gonna be substantially impacting the performance of glyphosate. So we need to understand our water quality that we're using. If we do have bore water and it is of lower quality, how are we going to address it? We're probably going to use ammonium sulfate. So I go back to those same uh, pictures I just had before. So glyphosate um, plus LI700 on soft water, on hard water. 
Now we've added ammonium sulfate as well uh, to the hard water. And you can see there that the performance is equal, if not better than the glyphosate alone. So LIA is used in this situation, in this trial, but ammonium sulfate, really important uh, factor for glyphosate, particularly if you're using uh, poorer quality water, particularly if it's come from underground. So I'm a big supporter of, glyph of ammonium sulfate with glyphosate. It does four different things. It's gonna fix your hard water problem. May not fully fix your bicarbonate problem, but it's certainly gonna help. It's gonna help with your tank mix compatibility. And it's also gonna help with glyphosate and other acid herbicides getting across into the cells easier and also the cells within your vascular bundle and helping translocation as well as cell entry as well. Don't have time to go through the process of how that happens, but uh, trust me, it's also helping within the plant as well. So big support of ammonium sulfate with glyphosate applications, certainly in poor quality water, but even if you've got good quality water, you can often see a substantial increase. Um, key factors with ammonium sulfate, it needs time. Uh, you, if you're using granular formulation, it's gotta be fully dissolved. Um, that's gonna depend on the temperature of the water. Um, and the quality of the granule that you're dealing with. Uh, can be anything from five minutes to maybe 10 or 15 minutes to get it fully dissolved. Um, so you need to have that, and then you need to give it a little bit of time to work after you've actually got it dissolved. So it does put a time constraint on if you're using granular formulation, you can move to the liquid, you've solved the first problem of the uh, dissolving, it still needs a bit of time under agitation to actually work. Um, but yeah, it does need a little bit of patience. Formula down there at the bottom is if you actually want to calculate how much you need, you can work that off your water test or you can just follow label advice. Another data set to back up the importance of spray quality. So I'm going to zip through this pretty quickly. This is some work from uh, Goa in central New South Wales from ball water on a glyphosate population um, of ryegrass that was glyphosate resistance. And here's your water quality if you're interested in how bad the water quality was. So uh, over 120 plants per square metre of uh, ryegrass, pretty good population in the untreated. Rainwater, half a litre on this resistant population using rainwater at 50 litres a hectare gave us a pretty good uh, control of the ryegrass, even on that resistant population. Switch it out to bore water at that same 50 litre rate, not as good. Um, is that acceptable? Questionable. Increased the rate of bore water. So we now gone up to 100 litres per hectare spray volume, still at that low rate of uh, you know, glyphosate and things have got worse. So now as you've added more water, you've added more cations and bicarbonates into the spray solution. That's had a bigger impact on your glyphosate and you can see where um, your glyphosate performance now has fallen to. Again, LI700 not fixing that problem. Anything that had sulphate of ammonia, ammonium sulphate, same thing has largely fixed the problem. And of interest in this trial, there was a reverse osmosis plant available on farm. So water that had bore water that had come out of the RO plant, even applied at that 100 litre rate, um, has done a pretty good job, almost as good or equally as good as the rainwater um, because the quality of water coming out of that RO plant effectively brings it back to drinking water quality. So importance of water quality, can't understate it when you're dealing with glyphosate. <clears throat> Partner herbicides. We, for efficiency, we wanna throw a whole heap of things into the spray tank. What I've done here, and I won't go through this line by line in the interest of time, but I've pretty much listed all the things that I think you, know, you might likely to be wanting to put into your spray tank with glyphosate and how that's likely to affect the performance of glyphosate. Often people look at what we talk about physical compatibility, i.e. does stuff go glunky in the spray tank and block nozzles. Um, this coffin is more a formulation specific thing. So you can get different results based off different combinations of formulations. So I sort of listed a few there where some of the issues you need to be aware of. Um, however, my point being is just because it mixed up and it got out of the spray nozzle okay doesn't necessarily mean to say that it's not having a biological impact on the plant. So I've listed over here some of the biological issues uh, that we also need to deal with. So you can read those 
um, either now or come back to those at the end of the webinar. But the key ones that I'm sort of, I've highlighted here in bold are where we really get ourselves in trouble, uh, particularly those that are fast acting contact herbicides. And if they're gonna start damaging the plant relatively quickly, then we're gonna have more trouble getting glyphosate to optimize because glyphosate's a slow herbicide to work. So generally speaking, we don't wanna be throwing in anything that's going to show very fast speed of activity because that's gonna be damaging your translocation of your glyphosate. So key point here, nearly everything that we want to add to glyphosate is gonna detract from the performance of glyphosate in its own right. It's whether it's a small detraction and we can live with it or whether it's a large detraction we can overcome most of that by applying, apart from those ones that are highlighted in bold there, the rest of it we can generally overcome by applying higher rates of glyphosate, um, but that obviously comes at a cost to do that. Um, again, just some photos of antagonism here. So again, uh, out of some of these trials by New Farm. So glyphosate alone, we've added an oil, um, Oils aren't fantastic for glyphosate. That performance has dropped off slightly. Not sure how it's coming up on everybody's screens there. We've added a decent rate of 2,4-D amine. Performance has dropped off quite a bit uh, from glyphosate alone. You add the oil and the amine at that rate and it's a pretty much a disaster. So all of these things add up. Um, you can do one thing, compromise glyphosate slightly and get away with it. The more things you try to do, the more likelihood you've got of having problems. So if you're using 2,4-D here, I've made a comment there, you really wanna keep the glyphosate rate at least two to one, two parts glyphosate, one part 2,4-D, preferably three to one to try to minimize that level of antagonism. Surfactants, we could spend a lot of time talking about surfactants. I'm gonna hit on it pretty darn quickly. Um, key points I wanna make. You, there is different surfactant packages with glyphosate, be with the different salts and the different loadings that we're using. So they're not all the same um, is the first point I'm gonna make. Somewhat surprising to a lot of growers, the surfactant system that's in a glyphosate formulation isn't just in there to maximize the efficacy of glyphosate. All these other things here are all factors that a formulation chemist is gonna be dealing with when he's gonna choose the surfactant that he's gonna put in the formulation. Um, and so, you know, with a big volume product like glyphosate and products going into various different segments, he's going to potentially choose different uh, surfactants to hit some of those depending on which ones, you know, they want to uh, you know, deliver out in the field. So some of these things expected dilution. So we're talking about a formulation which is predominantly going into broad acre, being applied at 50 to 70 litres a hectare or home garden, which is going to be applied at 500 to 1,000 uh, liters spray volume per hectare. Big differences in the surfactant you're gonna choose, just using that as an example. So a lot of differences in formulations. Um, there's differences in product. I threw this slide in because this just caught my eye from a uh, trial I was at last year. I happened to be up in Queensland. Two different CT formulations applied at the same rate, side by side, same spray applicator, same day, within minutes to each other across a range of different crop um, volunteer crops. And when I rated this, this formulation over here, I rated better on the chickpeas and the volunteer canola. This one I rated better on the favor beans and the field peas. So it's not gonna be the same. You're not gonna have one formulation which is gonna work better across all um, formulation, all, all weeds and weed targets. There can be differences depending on individual weeds. So just because you know one formulation has worked better in one scenario, slightly better, may not necessarily hold true across the board. And it's all around the adjuvant package between the differences between the formulations. So what do I want from an adjuvant package? Um, or do I need to add any more in the first place? Inadequate surfactant in the formulation, but how do you know? I can't answer that question for you. Generally speaking, if your glyphosate rate's low and your spray volume's high, you're probably gonna see a response to um, extra surfactant. Talk to that in a sec. Um, you're probably gonna see, or you may see a response in difficult to cover uh, weed situations. So woody plants where you really want a high level of coverage, 
waxier, hairy leaf surfaces, you might also see a response to adding more surfactant. But the flip side with that is generally you're getting that from more coverage, which means you're gonna have a droplet which is gonna spread out more, which is gonna have faster rate of evaporation. So the converse to more coverage might mean that you're not gonna get as much herbicide into the plant. And of course, if your partner herbicide actually has need for a specific surfactant, then you're gonna to have to go down that path. Um, oils, oil and glyphosate don't go together. Glyphosate doesn't like oil, it's not gonna to respond to oil. No point putting oils into the formulation. If you're seeing a response to products like hasten or uptake, understand that they have about 15 to 20% surfactant in the formulation. The response you're gonna to see to glyphosate to those type of products is coming from the surfactant, it's not coming from the oil component. Um, spray volume. So what I was talking about here is surfactant concentration. When a formulator is making a glyphosate formulation, they've got to think about what is the typical application volume that product's going to be applied at and put the right amount of surfactant in for that use pattern. So for example, this is a pretty common uh, glyphosate CT formulation with this particular surfactant in there. Um, if you're going to be applying it around about, say, 50 to 75 litres per hectare to around about a litre of product per hectare, you're going to have about that concentration of surfactant. That's probably going to be fine. If you're going to double your rate, you're going to have heaps of surfactant in the formulation. There's not going to be any point adding any more um, from a tank mix point of view. If you're using that same formulation and you want to come down to, say, half a litre at 150 litres spray volume, you probably don't have enough. Therefore, you're going to see a response to adding extra uh, surfactant. So it really depends on the spray volume that you're using. And the type of surfactant is also important. So very quickly on this graph, um, in the interest of time, glyphosate with no surfactant, about 40% of the glyphosate penetrated the leaf in this trial. This is this taloamine surfactant that was in the original glyphosate Roundup uh, CT formulation works very well. You can understand why Monsanto chose that surfactant. These are all non-ionic surfactants. So if you go and buy non-ionic surfactant, it's a bit like walking into your, um, sending you know, your spouse into the uh, downtown and saying, come back and buy me a car. There's so many different options you can buy. Same thing with non-ionic surfactants, that you can have a non-ionic surfactant, which is a very high level of spread, we can have a non-ionic surfactant, which has got a very low level of spread on the leaf surface. And this data is ranked here of just a range of different non-ionic surfactants um, from low level of spread to high level of spread and the corresponding glyphosate leaf uptake. So the more spread we get with glyphosate, the less we're gonna get into the leaf. If you're adding a surfactant, you actually want one that's a low spreading surfactant, but a high penetrating surfactant. Um, so just using a general purpose surfactant isn't necessarily the best thing for glyphosate. Haven't got time to go into that in any more detail, unfortunately. Uh, I want to touch on dust on wheel tracks. So we see this quite a lot. What's driving it? There can be two different things driving it. It can be more dust created um, on the wheel tracks. Can also be deposition behind the sprayer, particularly as you've got larger uh, sprayers moving fast. And you know, this data set, this is just for one particular setup, doesn't mean to say it's happening on every setup, but you're getting a real uh, drag in behind the sprayer and lack of deposition in behind those, uh, the wheel tracks, which is going to combination of dust and low droplet uh, production can end up with this sort of wheel tracking effect. So quite commonly, we will increase the droplet size over the wheel tracks to, if we know we've got this uh, issue happening, water sensitive paper, our best friend to actually understand what the deposition is across the width of the boom. So that's all about getting it into the plant. Very quickly, a couple of slides and we'll move into some questions on translocating to the roots. So basically what happens with glyphosate, about 30 to 50% of what moves into the leaf will stay in the leaf. The bit that really works for us is the mobility down to the roots. You're gonna get somewhere around 20 to 30% of your glyphosate moves down to the roots. Um, it's only gonna happen when your plant is moving carbohydrates down the plant. So it's photosynthesizing and moving down the plant. So that really doesn't start till about the second true leaf. 
you've got to have good soil moisture to have translocation happening. So if the soil moisture is dry, you won't be getting translocation down to the roots of the plant. And complicated process, but basically glyphosate gets down to the roots of the plant, shuts down the translocation of sugars um, after about three days. So after about three days, glyphosate shuts down its own translocation. What's the implication of that? If I'm going to come along with double knocking cultivation or fast brand out partners, anything that's going to destroy the flow of the plant, which I'm using to translocate my glyphosate, I really don't want to see that happening for three days after application to get as much glyphosate as I possibly can down into the roots. And that's really what sets glyphosate apart from most of our other herbicides, that activity down the roots of the plant. So I don't like to see on larger weeds these practices for three days after application. Speed of brownout, I touched on this before. Um, once you're seeing these fast visual brownout system, symptoms, that's cell death. Um, the same thing will be happening to that vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem. So if you're gonna start damaging your vascular tissue within hours or days after application, you, you're blowing up the railway tracks that glyphosate's wanting to move on. Um, so you're not gonna be getting that same glyphosate translocating down to the plant. So wanting fast brownout with glyphosate is not something we should be uh, striving for. It's completely the opposite. We need glyphosate to get down to the roots of the plant, ideally three days before we're starting to see brownout. So products like Paraquat, high rates of group G, glufosinate, they're all gonna cause fast brownout, um, are gonna be detrimental to the movement of glyphosate down to the roots of the plant. Um, the other one, which I usually point out, time to sowing. Um, you see claims of one hour commencement to sowing. Think back to that uh, data set, which I had earlier from New Farm with those two formulations, which are very fast entering herbicides. And think back to how much glyphosate had moved into the plant within one or two hours after application. It's only gonna be a small fraction of what you've applied. Um, so you, you, if you've applied a big rate, and you've got very sensitive weeds and they're very small, that may be enough to get, you know, 10 or 20% of the glyphosate in the plant may be enough to allow you to start sowing. But if you've got big weeds, you've got difficult problems, you need to let the glyphosate get into the plant and translocate down. You go and sow and you throw dirt on top of glyphosate that still has an end of the leaf, what's gonna to happen to that? It's gonna bind to the dirt almost instantaneously. So beware of uh, speed of sowing following glyphosate applications. So to, to pull that together into a bit of a summary, if I'm looking to optimize my glyphosate specifically, I'm gonna be looking for warm, but not hot uh, summer conditions, um, lower rates of, of evaporation, which means higher humidities. I realize that's not gonna be an option in a lot of scenarios. I'm gonna be using large droplets as a general preference and keep my water rate lower rather than higher, but I'm still gonna make sure that I've got plenty of coverage onto the target. So if I've got small targets, I might need higher water rates just to make sure I've hit the target. Small weeds, no rain for six hours after application. Keep my rates up if I've got other things going against me. Ammonium sulfate's a definite tick. Good water quality's a tick. Good formulation's a tick. It's all about the adjuvants. Not gonna put in anything that's antagonistic if I really wanna optimize my glyphosate. I might be doing that for practicality and the tank mix partner might work better on some weeds if glyphosate doesn't work. So the overall combination might be better, but it's not gonna help the glyphosate component. I'm gonna slow down, I'm gonna get my boom height lower, which is gonna give me better deposition and less spray drift. And I'm gonna be obviously treating a susceptible population if I can. So they're my sort of take home messages of what's gonna help me get the best I can out of glyphosate. So I've gone through that really super quick. Um, apologize for those that might have struggled to keep up and there's probably been a lot of questions which have been um, you know, arisen from that. I'd normally spend a few hours going through how glyphosate works if anybody has been to my workshops, but in the interest of time and keeping everybody on track here, I've tried to pull that up relatively quickly of what I consider to be the main key points. Um, what we want to do now for the rest of the time we've got available is throw the questions open. Um, we can focus on glyphosate. We can broaden it out a little bit to fallow spraying in general. 
We have got some pre-prepared questions which we've already been asked to address, so we can move into those. Um, but I've got Randall hopefully online as well, um, looking at some questions while I've been presenting. So Randall, do you want to unmute yourself and see where we want to go with regard to questions and answers? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, we've already had a few questions come in. I'd just like to encourage everyone to use the Q&A function, please, rather than the chat function. It's just a bit easier for me to moderate and uh, pass those questions over to Mark. But if I just open it up, Mark, um, we certainly have a few here already. Um, David has asked uh, from, the, from early on in your presentation, do you want to just give us a brief uh, comparison, please, between citric acid versus AMS? Okay, so... Acids are largely fixing pH. Now that's going to change some of the solubility of your cations in the formulation. So acids in general, be it citric or propionic or whatever, um, they, they can change the solubility of some of those calciums and magnesiums and can in some degree take them out of solution. But what AMS actually does is it breaks apart. So you've got ammonium sulfate. So it actually breaks apart to ammonium and sulfate and then the sulfate binds with the cations. So it'll grab, um, say calcium, make calcium sulfate, which is insoluble and pull that truly out of solution. So generally ammonium sulfate is more effective of neutralizing hard water than what any acid's gonna be. Um, the different type of acid depends on what we call a pKa of the acid, um, which is the pH where the acid wants to have equilibrium. It's a very complex uh, thing to get your head around. Um, citric acid will effectively, if you keep pouring more citric acid in, you'll drive your pH very low. We then generally don't tend to use that in pH buffering solutions. We tend to use propionic acid because that will generally buffer down to around about pH 5 to 5.5. Citric acid will keep going lower if you keep pouring more in. So there's a bit of difference between the different acids. But generally speaking, ammonium sulfate does a much better job of neutralizing cations than just using an acid. Thank you. Uh, Caroline has asked, will granular ammonium sulfate settle out again if you mix it the night before? Generally, I find no. Um, what it will do is it will actually as I said, split into ammonium and sulfate, and then those sulfates will grab the, the cations in the water, so the calciums and magnesiums, and they'll precipitate out, and they're generally pretty insoluble, and they won't go back into solution. So I don't really have problems of actually pre-treating the water um, day or more uh, beforehand if you've got storage tanks to be able to do that. Uh, Jack has written in and asked, Mark, can you give us your thoughts, please, on group Gs, Viraxor, for example, that require hasten, obviously, when using with glyphosate? Can we move to an alternative that will have less impact on the gly efficacy? I suggest this also goes to uh, the carfentrazone products or just the whole range of group Gs. Yeah. Um, difficult question, and there's no right answer to this. So... The oil surfactant blends like hasten or uptake or those type of products, um, they're doing a couple of things. They've got the oil, which helps oil-based herbicides like your group G's penetrate. And then they've also got a decent surfactant rate in there as well, which gives you spreading on the leaf surface. So they're the right uh, surfactant for those herbicides. If we were to switch to just a standard non oak surfactant, we'd still get some level of spread, but we don't have the oil. So you're going to have a drop off in performance from your Group G herbicide. Um, but the Group G is still going to get in. It's still going to start damaging fast, um, well before the glyphosate has got in and fully translocated around the plant. So we are compromising the performance of glyphosate by switching to a surfactant rather than an oil surfactant. Um, it might not work quite so fast, but it's still gonna probably work fast to disrupt the optimal performance of glyphosate. Now, I also wanna add at that point in time, um, the higher the rate of these group G herbicides, the more horsepower they're gonna to bring to the mix in their own right, even though they're compromising glyphosate more. 
So as we go up in application rate of these products, they're going to start doing more of the weed control from the group G side of things, even though they might be knocking the glyphosate around more. That may mean on certain species that the combination actually works better when these two products are mixed. And that's going to be a species by species thing, depending on where the efficacy is coming from. Is it coming more from the glyphosate end or more from the group G end? So think about that a little bit. Usually where we've been historically with those Greek G herbicides, we've been using them in uh, autumn fallows under relatively low light intensities where they work relatively low and at very low or usually fairly low rates of active ingredient per hectare basis for those Group G herbicides. So where we keep the rate low and the light intensity low and we've got a robust rate of glyphosate in that, say that autumn knockdown market, they generally work relatively well and we aren't overly compromising the glyphosate and we can address that by increasing the rate of glyphosate. When we go to summer, if you're gonna start using those products, they're gonna work faster. Often we're using higher rates. A lot of the label use patterns for the group G herbicides now are coming out in higher rates. If we're gonna claim residual control with those group G herbicides, it's gonna be at extremely high rates. So all those areas are where I'm much more concerned about how they're compromising the glyphosate performance. But as I said, the combination may still be the right to go. It's gonna to depend totally on the weed that we're trying to chase. Uh, Brad wants to know, is it safe to assume that a product with a shorter rain fast period, for example, an hour, will penetrate the leaf quicker than one with a longer rain fast period, six hours? Yeah. General rule of thumb, yes. So, you know, what that's reflecting is, you know, the, the rain fast period is basically saying this herbicide takes a fair length of time to move in through the leaf. And we're concerned that we get rain within that period, it's going to wash off. If the label's saying it's going to, you know, have one hour rain fast period, then fair call that it's going to move into the leaf significantly faster. So, you know, when it comes to rain fast periods with glyphosate, there's a bit of information that's a bit all over the place. You know, some formulations will get into the leaf slightly faster than others. And that may mean that people might go with a slower rain, uh, sorry, a shorter rain fast period. Um, but also keep in mind, rain fast period is a guide. Um, it's not a light switch on or off. So if it says six hour rain fast, it doesn't mean that, you know, um, rain at five and a half hours is going to be completely detrimental and six and a half hours is going to be you know completely fine it's a guide to how much time we need to get that herbicide generally into the plant um, of course intensity of rain is going to have a big impact um, the leaf surface is going to have a big impact as how easy it is to wash that droplet off but to come back to the original question it's a pretty good guide as to how fast you know where that herbicide is going to be fast to enter the leaf or slow to enter the leaf Yep, beautiful. Uh, Sam would like to know, can you comment on spraying the summer weeds with glypho during high delta T and the impact when the weeds are not under moisture stress? Particularly if there's a lot of subsoil moisture, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, moisture, well, you know, we want subsoil moisture to keep translocation going. So that's the key thing that I'm looking at for, um, you know, moisture. So if you've got good soil moisture, fairly good chance that they're moving carbohydrates around the plant and therefore the flow on is working pretty well within the plant. So my concern when, you know, when we get dry conditions after application, we're starting to run out of soil moisture, is translocation starts shutting down. And if it gets too bad, then we don't get that glyphosate translocating down the roots and we're only working off glyphosate activity in the leaf, which isn't as useful as having both activity in the leaf and the roots. So that's where I'm thinking about from a soil moisture perspective. Um, the delta T or what's happening above ground, um, as I sort of indicated back there in the, um, the slide, two things are happening. Um, if it's hot and dry, the plant's going to effectively thicken up that cuticle uh, to slow down the rate of moisture loss out of the leaf, which is going to make it harder for glyphosate to penetrate in the opposite direction. And my droplet isn't going to survive as long and I'm not going to have the same number of hours on the leaf surface. So I'm looking at when I'm thinking about making a glyphosate application is I'm thinking about the 
this is where I do use delta T, is the delta T at time of application, but then also for the next two, four, six hours after application where I'm trying to get that glyphosate actually still penetrating through and how fast that's affecting um, the environment that that droplet's surviving under. So if I've got you know, uh, poor delta T conditions, I know that droplet's gonna have significantly less time on the leaf surface. Um, so therefore I'm only gonna be getting glyphosate moving in for an, an hour, two hours, say after application, that's gonna mean I'm gonna need to compensate by applying a much higher rate um, so that I'm maximizing how much I'm getting in in that first hour or two. Um, you know, in all situations, um, getting 20% into the leaf of two liters a hectare is gonna get more into the plant than 20% of one liter. Right, I've got a couple of questions coming in about um, spikes again, so we'll, we'll go back to that. Do recommended rates of the group Gs damage the cells of grass weeds and therefore cause the antagonism in grasses from Peter? Yeah, so grasses versus broadleafs and group Gs. So generally speaking, the group G is going to be doing significantly more of the horsepower on the, um, the broadleaf weed. So you don't see as much antagonism because you're getting more horsepower coming out of the group G itself. So you might be losing some performance of the glyphosate, but you're compensating for that by the activity from the group G herbicide, particularly for those herbicides that um, the group G herbicide you know, works on. So if you think something like marshmallow, where they're particularly sensitive to group G herbicides, we're gonna get more bang for our buck out of the group G component. And if we're compromising the glyphosate, that's not as important. Generally speaking, most of the group Gs are relatively weak on grasses, particularly at the rates that we have been typically using. So you tend to see more um, drop off in performance on grass weeds when you make that mixture, because it's you're not getting that extra benefit coming through from the group G herbicide. Now, with most, with some of your group G herbicides, not all of them, but for some of them, if you start increasing the rate of the group G herbicide, then they start having some pretty useful activity in their own right on grass weeds. So that's what we're seeing with some of the newer use patterns is we're starting to go up in the rate. The group G herbicide in its own right is starting to give some pretty useful uh, level of efficacy on you know, particularly ryegrass, not, maybe not so much on the summer grasses. Um, but there, that extra performance is coming from the group G working. There will still be a corresponding drop off in translocation of the glyphosate, but that may be less important if the group G's bringing more to the table, if that makes sense. On that, uh, Greg wants to know, once we get to autumn, is the new normal glyphosate on its own first up, just with AMS and an adjuvant, and then go with the group G with paraquat together in the second knock? Love it. <laughs> that's what I'm doing if I'm spending my money. Um, yeah, that's the... Yeah, the other thing I haven't really talked about with the group Gs, you know, we sort of touched on the adjuvant thing isn't really right, and we're going to be making a compromise between the right adjuvant for glyphosate and the right adjuvant for group G. We've talked about the translocation issue. Um, the other bit's the droplet spectrum as well. You know, generally speaking, with glyphosate, I'm going to preferentially want to be at a very coarse um, and at a lower rate to keep my concentration high. So with glyphosate on a decent uh, target, I'm probably thinking, you know, 50, 60, 70 litres a hectare with a very coarse. For my group G herbicide, I'm wanting to be 80, 90, 100 litres a hectare with probably medium coarse. Um, so again, we're making a compromise. But if we throw the group G in with a second paraquat double knock, um, then the way we're going to apply them, as in water rates and droplet size, is actually going to match up quite nicely as well. Uh, Nathan would like to know, does sunlight affect glyphosate uptake? Uh, no great evidence that I've seen that it has a major impact. Um, plants do need sunlight to, for photosynthesis to be occurring 
and you need photosynthesis to have translocation occurring. So while sunlight doesn't really have a major impact and you know if we're spraying on a cloudy day versus a sunny day it doesn't really make a major impact on glyphosate um, we do need sun occurring to uh, have translocation occurring to get glyphosate down to the roots of the plant but we're talking you know um, multi-day process for that to occur anyway so generally that's not a major consideration but um, yeah you know if you had really bad overcast cloudy miserable weather for consecutive days on end um, your translocation is probably going to slow down a fair bit um, but relatively minor not sunlight doesn't impact glyphosate anywhere near as does some of the other herbicides which work directly on photosynthesis right i say it's plenty of questions coming in thank you for people who are putting them into the q a chat um uh, Murray has asked here, it's a lengthy question. So spray droplets, even very coarse or larger, have a very short life, even in moderate Delta Ts. So looking at the rate of glypho uptake in the ARG slide provided by New Farm, a very small amount would be taken up before the droplets dry. Can the product still enter the leaf after the application and droplets dry? Yeah. Um, thanks, Murray. <laughs> Uh, it is a tricky uh, concept to get our heads across. So there's a couple of things that happen with regard to droplets drying. So you've got, um, obviously your formulated product goes into solution in your spray tank and you've got some droplets there in a, uh, you've got some molecules of herbicide in a spray droplet. So the first thing that happens on the leaf surface is the moisture evaporates out of that droplet, but your actual molecule of herbicide is still fully hydrated. Um, it's probably the best way I could um, describe it. So we've actually lost the, you know, relatively quickly, we've lost the, the true water out of the spray droplet, but we've still got a high rate of water in the actual molecule or herbicide. Now that's going to continue to dry. So the um, best way I can sort of explain that is the actual molecule or herbicide starts off in a fully hydrated state. Um, it then proceeds to lose moisture out of that actual molecule of herbicide significantly after the droplet has actually dried and the moisture has been lost out of the droplet. And then eventually, some time, some hours later, it eventually becomes pure crystalline glyphosate or all our other herbicides pretty much go in the same scenario as well. They go crystalline on the leaf surface, particularly those water-based herbicides. So what tends to happen is the rate of transfer in the leaf is generally pretty fast soon after application and then it slows down as that actual molecule or herbicide is dehydrating. Then in the case of glyphosate you can get the situation whereas if you get a decent dew the next day some of that crystalline glyphosate which is still sitting on the leaf surface may pick up enough moisture from the dew to semi-solubilize again, and you can get more glyphosate moving back into that plant. So if you're using radio-labeled glyphosate, it's not unusual to see a increasing amount of glyphosate um, for the first few hours you're moving into the plant, and then everything sort of flattens off for a while, and then sometimes around you know, the next morning, you might see another bit of a spike up again uh, with glyphosate, you know, uh, concentration of the leaf jumping up again, and that's most likely solubilization in the dew. You're probably not going to rely on that, but it's just actually what happens. So it's still a relatively slow path for water-loving herbicides like glyphosate to get into the leaf, but it's quite complex in that um, it's not just as fast as what we're visually seeing from that droplet evaporating. Righto, thank you. Uh, Josh has come along here and written a question for us regarding this as goes to the essence of sort of what this was set up around the high cost of glyphosate. So is reducing the glypho 450 type glyphos application rate below a litre a hectare an option on smaller weeds given current soil moisture in many parts? If so, how would you go about thinking through this strategy? The question comes given the current high cost of glyphosate. Yeah. Really good question. Um, and thinking through the strategy, how I'm going to use that if I'm going to be using lower rates rather than higher rates. So 
The first thing that's jumping into my mind is climatic conditions after application is important. So looking at those Delta Ts, I'm gonna be applying it, you know, probably pretty early in the morning um, and not picking a day where I know it's gonna to get to, um, you know, 35, 40 degrees and 20% humidity soon after application. So I'm gonna be thinking about when in the day I'm gonna be applying it. I'm gonna want at least for a few hours after application, really good conditions. That's number one thing I'm thinking about. Number two thing I'm thinking about is weed size. So if my weed size is small, um, I'm gonna need much less product uh, to get into the plant. And when I mean small, I mean small. Um, I'm thinking, you know, particularly for broadleaf weeds, look at the taproot. If the taproot started to get any size to it, so your know, plants can still be small on top, but if you're starting to get um, fairly large taproot, then they're not actually a small weed, they're gonna require higher rates. But if my weed size is genuinely small, so, you know, thinking, you know, maybe five centimetre rosettes or, you know, two, three leaf grass weeds, um, then you've got a much better chance of requiring less glyphosate. Um, a strategy which has become very common in Northern Australia, um, where we've got a high level of glyphosate resistance and we're still wanting to use glyphosate in the program, is going and flying on the glyphosate very soon after a rainfall event. So if we go and do that, um, what's happening? We've got good soil moisture. Uh, we've generally got, you know, if we're talking three to five days after a rainfall event, we've germinated some weeds. A couple of days after that, we're coming back potentially with a plane. Uh, you know, we might have relatively mild conditions. It might not, hopefully hasn't got stinking hot by then. We can fly on a relatively low rate of glyphosate. We're probably not going to be throwing too many other things in the paddock. Um, at least that's what we're doing up in the north. And then we're coming back with that second, we're planning to come back with that second double knock pass. And that's when we're throwing the extra uh, partner herbicides in, you know, paraquat based uh, double knock. Once it's dry enough to get our tractor back on the paddock. And that strategy is really effective of keeping the glyphosate rate relatively low and works even on mild glyphosate resistant populations. You know, it's working quite well for a lot of growers. So, yeah, so I'm thinking about, you know, um, what's the weed size? Uh, you know, obviously, you know, the rate's going to depend on the actual weed target and how susceptible that is to glyphosate in the first place. But if you're looking at lower rates, it's, um, you know, what's the weed size? What's the the conditions at application, conditions after application and resistance status. And am I prepared to double knock are probably the things that I'm thinking through. Yeah, thanks. That, uh, that helps answer the, the question around some upper EP uh, growers who were using a plane for the first time this year due to the fact that after the big rain event, um, there's a lot of erosion across paddocks and they simply can't find there. So uh, that helps answer that one of those other questions that had come in earlier around using planes. Um, Oscar would like to know, what do you consider the best broadleaf mixing partner for that summer fallow that has the least amount of antagonism with glyphosate? Um, 2,4-D has generally been pretty robust across, you know, the, um, you know, the range of, you know, historical applications. So there is certainly antagonism, you know, you see more antagonism on grasses and as I mentioned earlier on, if you keep the rate of 2,4-D relatively low and the rate of glyphosate high on glyphosate susceptible weeds, you generally don't see a great deal of antagonism. Um, ester versus amine, uh, generally speaking, you're gonna have less physical compatibility issues with ester. I'm not saying they don't happen, but generally speaking, you have more problems with amine than ester. That's more around things going glunky in the spray tank than actually you know, performance out in the paddock. Um, so conversely, you know, S is gonna get into the plant a lot quicker than what amine is gonna do um, in there. So the S is gonna get in faster than what the glyphosate is gonna get into on the leaf surface. Um, but generally speaking, you know, 2,4-D is a pretty common mix while, while it certainly has a level of incompatibility from a biological point of view, it's generally able to be overcome providing we keep our rate of glyphosate relatively high, shows up more when you've got resistance kicking in. Um, 
Group G's in summer, I just don't like. Um, I just see way too much regrowth uh, coming in that situation as we don't get the translocation there. Um, you know, any of the other group I's, same thing applies. You know, there is a level of antagonism, but you can generally manage that um, if we keep our rates relatively robust in my glyphosate component. Um, group B herbicides are probably the other one people might want to, you know, mix in there. So, you know, things like metsulfuron, they generally don't have any major compatibility problems there. You know, they, there's other reasons why we don't want to be using those, um, you know, often for the plant back issues coming back into the next rotational crop. But from a compatibility point of view, they generally don't cause major detrimental issues to glyphosate. Um, they're probably the main things that you're most likely to be mixing in summer. Um, Triclopur, uh, the, at the application rate we're using of triclopur on a grams per hectare basis, it's not particularly antagonistic to the glyphosate. Um, the bigger challenge you have with triclopur glyphosate mixtures is the uptake or hasten type products, which really help the, uh, the garlon or the triclopur aren't the best adjuvants for the glyphosate and then can start disrupting the adjuvant package, which is already in your glyphosate and can lead to sometimes you'll see poorer grass weed control uh, from that combination. But it's not the triclopur itself, it's the adjuvant that you're throwing in. I've got a couple of questions here about uh, quality of, of actual glyphosates. Mm -hmm. So is, uh, is CT plus LI700 Liberate as good and speedy into the plant in an hour than say crucial? Is the type of glyphosate salt that is speedy or is the wetter package that speeds up the uptake? Yeah, okay. Um, difficult question to answer definitively because generally we don't get told what surfactant packages are in what formulations. You know, most of the companies keep that as, um, as a trade secret. So we're surmising in a lot of situations of what's going on. Um, pretty much, you know, there's one crucial formulation. So we're pretty confident that, you know, any drum that has crucial on the label is going to perform the same as any other drum. When you get to CT, there can be a whole heap of different ways you can make a glyphosate 450 CT formulation. And, you know, I had a slide there earlier of all the things that a formulation chemist might be doing when he's choosing the particular surfactant. So when you get into you know, the different brands of CT, there's a high likelihood that they're going to have different surfactants between different brands. Um, and I can't easily give you a good indication to know what is a good quality CT versus you know, what, uh, you know, what is a different CT. I'm not going to call them poor quality. It might be a deliberate decision from the formulation chemist who made that particular 450 CT that he might be targeting different objectives with the surfactant package that he's putting in. And as I mentioned back on that slide earlier, um, when a formulation chemist is building a formulation, he's not always thinking that efficacy out in the paddock in 40 degree summer is the only thing that I'm thinking about when I'm making a decision of what surfactants I'm putting into that formulation. He might be thinking about other things as well. Um, so yeah, come back to your question. Can we utilize a 450 CT? Yeah, well, is a 450 CT going to be as good or better or worse than say a crucial? I actually really like the original 450 Roundup CT using that taloamine surfactant. You can find those formulations and you know, sort of talk to your supplier about you know, whether they've got access to those. I think for summer application, it's probably one of my preferred um, surfactant systems for glyphosate. Um, it's a good surfactant. It doesn't give you high level of droplet spread, but it does give you good level of droplet penetrant, having that taloamine surfactant in there. Um, the other thing, which is a bit of a side, when you're using that particular surfactant, it makes the formulation very viscous. To overcome that, you also put polyethylene glycol into the uh, original Roundup CT formulation. That helps the viscosity from a you know, flowability point of view, but it also slows down the speed of evaporation of the droplet when it's on the leaf surface. So that original 450 CT formulation 
uh, was a very good formulation for summer fallow spraying. Now, I still don't think it's been beaten by any of the formulations that have followed since as a general rule, but not everything that says 450 CT on the front of the drum actually has that surfactant system anymore. So I realize that's not a definitive answer, um, but without knowing what's actually the surfactant actually in the formulation of a 450 CT, it's very hard to be definitive in your answer. Yep, thanks. Um, I've just got a question comment here from the regulator, David Stevenson has written in here. Um, don't overlook off target risk, especially with 2,4-D in the mix. Don't spray an inversions, which is illegal with 2,4-Ds. Off target vine damage has already occurred in South Australia this summer. It's a valid comment to throw in while, we, while we're going through. So thank you, David, for putting that one in. 100% endorse that. Uh, Andrew has asked, going back to group, group Gs, I'm struggling to kill marshmallows with glyphosate and a group G mix. Should I just use a heavier rate of glyphosate and leave out the group Gs? Okay, so I'm going to make the assumption that that's over summer application. Um, so the key thing with group Gs with marshmallow is, yes, they're very active on marshmallow, but they're not translocated to any significant extent. Um, and marshmallow quickly develops a really big taproot. Um, so you're not going to get, you know, uh, group Gs are going to work by far better on marshmallow and always for this, but you know, we're talking marshmallow here, but going to work very much better when your weeds are small. So what am I talking? Three to five centimetre rosettes and very small taproots. Once you get that bigger taproot, yeah, group G herbicide is just going to burn off your above ground foliage and isn't going to move down. Uh, glyphosate, again, on small marshmallow will do a pretty good job usually if you give it enough time because it will translocate into the tap roots. So again, on big old monster plants with ma massive tap roots, uh, it's not going to be perfect, um, but you can get, you know, uh, a lot more translocation down in the roots. Now, if we think back through what we were saying before, if your rate of group G, you know, you're trying to chase marshmallow and they've got a bit of size and you go, okay, what do I want to do? I'm going to start cranking my rate of group G higher to get some more uh, burn and foliar activity out of those group G herbicides. Um, that's going to disrupt my glyphosate more. I'm going to get less glyphosate down into the roots of the plant. Add in high light intensities in summer and the light intensity makes group G's herbicides work faster then all of that means they're going to be, they're going to struggle a lot more in summer than what they're going to do in an autumn situation. So I suspect that question was coming here. If you're struggling to make that mix work, it's probably a summer application. And if it hasn't been working, the tendency is, well, we'll throw more group G in and that's going to further compromise the uh, performance of the glyphosate. So if you've got small weeds and you're prepared to give it time and you want to drop the group G herbicide out and just wait for the glyphosate to do its job, usually it does a pretty good job by itself, but you, it's going to take time to do it. Uh, going back to uh, one of the slides you had about water rates versus glyphosate, uh, Jake would like to know, is there an opportunity to reduce water rates below 50 litres a hectare with the first knockdown pass of glyphosate? Um, different labels have different claims on there. So some labels now, I think I'm correct in saying this, some labels have added that you need to use a minimum of 50 litres a hectare spray volume for glyphosate. Now that's probably more around drift management, but if it says on the label that's um, what you're constrained to, then you're obviously constrained to following the label advice for the product you're using. I'm pretty, pretty confident in saying not all glyphosate labels have that uh, requirement for the 50 litres as the minimum spray volume. Um, if you're mixing 2,4-D in the mix, then yes, you're going to be at at least a minimum of 50 litres a hectare spray volume because of the requirements for the 2,4-D. But if you've just got glyphosate by itself, um, you can potentially uh, come under that sort of rate. Now, the issue you're going to have is coverage on the leaf surface if you start getting into lower application rates. So in theory, lower application rates give you a better concentration gradient and get more product into the leaf faster. 
So it's generally a better thing to do. But I also mentioned there that big droplets are also better for droplet survival as well. The challenge I have when you go to very big droplets and low water rates is have you physically got enough droplets to actually hit the target and keep droplets onto the target? So if you've got, you know, 30 centimetre, you've got dinner size plate, um, you know, broadleaf weeds, pretty good chance you're going to have some droplets landing on the target even if you're using relatively low water rates um, and large droplets. If you've got small broadleaf weeds or even worse, small grass weeds, and you're going to low water rates and you don't have a lot of droplets and they're very large, you may completely miss the target and therefore you get survivors. So yeah, you know, in general, lower water rates are good, but there becomes a point where you're going too low. And conversely, if you're talking about, you know, targeting one two leaf ryegrass with extra coarse um, or ultra coarse droplets you know, with glyphosate in, I'm probably wanting to be up around 70 or 80 litres of spray, hit, spray volume to make sure I've got enough droplets to actually hit the target. So even 50 is going to be too low in that situation. So again, I stress when I'm running any of my workshops, go to your nozzle supplier, get a pack of water-soluble paper. It's going to set you back $150, $200. Put water-soluble paper out and look at the amount of coverage you're getting of your leaf surface and you'll get pretty well-trained, set it up you know, either sitting upright in the paddock or horizontal in the paddock, depending on what type of target we're trying to hit. Um, you'll train yourself pretty quickly to know that the spray setup I've got is adequate to actually get um, enough droplets hitting the target. Very cheap and very easy way to do. Every aggro and every grower should have a pack in the glove box. Good advice. Um, uh, just we'll go, we've got a comment here from Jay Carl. We've only got uh, five or so minutes left. Um, so we'll just keep on with these questions for the time being. Jake uh, would like to know, can we increase the translocation of group G formulations by applying at night? Um, and we need sensitivity around acknowledging inversions and um, temperature. So some commentary around all of that too, please. Okay, so come back to your know, nights and inversions in a second. Um, let's do all first part first. Can we increase translocation of group Gs? Short answer is no. Um, they just don't have the right chemical properties to move in the phloem. So to move in the phloem, it's quite complex, but you have to have a particular um, set of chemical properties to move. Safflufenical or Sharpen has better, has better properties or has, you know, has reasonable properties for translocation pretty much all the other group G herbicides just don't have the right properties for translocation in the xylem, in the phloem, sorry, which is downwards within the plant. So um, I'll come back and make a comment on Sharpen, but for the rest of them, um, they're not gonna move in the phloem regardless of what you do. It doesn't matter, you can put them out at night or in the day. Uh, the night's gonna slow down their speed of cell death, but it's not gonna change the fact of translocation. They just won't translocate in the phloem. It's not possible to do it. Sharpen does have technically the ability to do it but while it's trying to translocate down to the roots or upwards you know um, within the plant as well it's also causing damage to that vascular system as it's doing it so yes you're going to get some more translocation out of safflofenical but I used the analogy before of a railway tracks and the product it's basically blowing up the railway tracks as it's moving along so you're going to get some movement um, but the faster you blow up those railway tracks, the less movement you're going to have of other um, products that are trying to follow, um, particularly for something like glyphosate, which is a bit slower to try to follow along. So while, yes, you know, Sharpen has a little bit of ability to translocate in the phloem, I'm not heavily relying on that because of its speed of activity. Um, now, the next comment with regard to nighttime spraying, inversions and all that sort of stuff, um, certainly with all products and it doesn't matter which product we're talking about at the moment if we're going to apply products at night particularly over summer we have a much greater chance of having an inversion present in the paddock and if you're going to release small droplets which don't have enough weight for gravity to take over and pull them down and you're going to release them into that inversion they are going to go wherever that inversion is going to end up um, 
across the landscape. So how are we going to manage that? We're going to manage it in a couple of different ways. So, you know, firstly, you know, some of the labels will start saying, do not imply in inversions. That's the simple way to, you know, if we don't put the product out under that condition, it's got no chance of being able to move. Large droplets, gravity takes over and pulls them down. So what we're concerned about, uh, if we're talking about inversions in particular, is droplet size less than 150 microns. They're the ones that gravity doesn't have enough uh, weight to pull down. And so they're going to be potentially suspended. If they get suspended in the, the uh, inversion, they can move as far as that inversion is going to go. So next sort of tick is, first ticks don't apply in their inversions at all. Next tick, using much larger droplets means the percentage of very small droplets likely to drift is going to be very much reduced. So we can usually get rid of the drift risk or that inversion risk if we're using very coarse or larger droplets, they're still gonna produce a small number of fines, but the number is gonna be extremely small. The next thing is release height from your boom that I really wanna stress. So if you've got your boom height relatively low, often the inversion might be sitting at, you know, a meter or more above the, um, the surface. If you're gonna release your, your droplets lower than that, best chance even those finer droplets will make them way down to a capturing surface like the stubble or the weeds. If you're going to reduce them, if you're going to release them higher into the inversion, then they're going to take off on you. Thing that, you know, boom height, thing that goes hand in hand with high release height is high travel speed. As we want to spray our paddocks at above 20 k's an hour, what almost invariably happens is we lift up our booms boom height so we don't whack the ground with the boom as it bounces across the paddock. So travel speed in its own right generally isn't a major issue. We can get turbulence created by fast um, movement of, of spray booms, which can lift some droplets up into the atmosphere. But generally, it's the fact that we increase our boom height when we travel fast. So um, Chris Peston gave a good example yesterday on the uh, update webinar, if anybody was listening to that with regard to Overwatch and uh, some of the application parameters, but back up everything he said there. You know, if we keep our boom heights very low, that's probably going to mean we're going to be bringing our uh, travel speed back down under 18k. Um, that's going to be a big factor in reducing the potential for off-target damage. Thanks, Mark. Um... I think we'll pull it up there. We're um, we're just fractionally over the time that we had allocated, but just uh, I'd like to just point out that um, the the update series yesterday with uh, on crop protection will was recorded and will be up on the GRDC website soon for people to go back and see them. I'll just pass over to um, to Jason now. Thanks a lot, uh, Randall. Um, yeah, with the current price of glyphosate, absolutely anything and everything we can do to get the most out of um, our spraying is really, really critical. Um, and I'm sure, you know, all the information you've heard today will, will help uh, do that. Uh, huge thank you to Mark, not just for his time and, and the information provided today, but um, also just to be so responsive um, and put, and, Put this webinar together in response to that rain um, on EP. Anybody who's been lucky enough to go to any of Mark's uh, workshops will know that you know he could have covered this in a whole day um, with the amount of information um, that's uh, there. So for yeah, for for you, Mark, to bring this down to um, a condensed version just for a webinar has been fantastic, and also just to answer you know these questions off the cuff. Um, so massive. Thank you to um, for you to be um, doing this here today. Um, yeah, as I said, a huge amount of info there. So I really encourage everybody to look for uh, resources that can also uh, help in this area. Um, so not just uh, th this recording, um, which you'll be emailed a link to. So go back and have a look at that. But also I I'd encourage you to Google uh, GRDC herbicide behavior and you'll see a lot of really good resources there, um, most of which Mark has written um, or co-written himself as well. So yeah, just whack in GRDC herbicide behavior into your browser 
um, and have a look at those resources. Um, that'll be really, really helpful. Um, massive thank you to Randall, not just for uh, facilitating the questions today, but also really being a driving force in getting this webinar um, happening um, in such a you know, quick turnaround time. Um, so massive thank you to him. Uh, also Erica in the background at ICANN, who's just um, got this show together and keeping everything running really, really well. So uh, a huge thank you to Erica um, as well. Um, yeah, again, thank you to everybody out there for uh, their attendance and listening and also participating in the Q&A. It would have been pretty boring um, if it was just, uh, just one way talking. So thanks for your interaction there. Really importantly, please encourage everybody to uh, fill out um, the evaluation and feedback back to us. So that's really important um, for both ICANN and GRDC. So we can really um, deliver what you want and what's helpful for you. So please take time to do that. Once again, uh, thank you everybody for uh, tuning in. Thanks again to Mark and Erica at uh, ICANN. Really hope that this has provided you some uh, you know, useful information that will help you with your summer spraying. Um, thanks once again for your attendance and uh, it's goodbye for today.